Thanks so much. Um, good morning, uh, or good afternoon, rather, um, colleagues and uh, fellow um, LIS students uh, that are attending this webinar today. I just want to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Leanne Brown, and I am at present the um, acting chair of the RETIC um, interest group. Um, I'm, my official position is the chair elect, but um, I'm also the acting chair at the moment. And for those of you that aren't familiar with RETIC, it stands for the Research, Education and Training Interest Group of LIASA. So um, the topic of our webinar today is right in line with the scope of our interest group. Um, the topic of the webinar is the, L, um, the LIS PhD journey. And we've got two wonderful speakers with us today. I'm going to be introducing them just now. Um, our webinar is scheduled for an hour and um, we are recording it. So those of you who experience any technical difficulties, um, that recording will be shared with everyone after the webinar, uh, well, once it's available. Um, so we are recording the session um, and um, without any further ado, if uh, just to, um, the usual housekeeping rules, please make sure that you are muted throughout the session, unless you want to say something. And what we are going to do is uh, we're going to take questions and comments after both speakers have uh, presented. So you're welcome to put any um, questions or comments you have in the chat session and uh, or the chat box, and then we will come back to you. Um, I'm just going to introduce um, our first speaker, who is Dr. Oknere um, Salubi. He is a lecturer at the Department of Library and Information Science at the University of the Western Cape. And he has accumulated um, industry-based experiences in public and academic libraries. And he has over four years cumulative experience um, of higher education teaching. In addition to Dr. Salubi's role as a lecturer, he also volunteers as a data instructor for the Carpentries, where he teaches uh, computational research data management and analytical tools. His research interests include um, information organization, um, digital literacy, digital humanities, and a data management. And then um, our second speaker will be Dr. Liesel Ball. Dr. Ball is a lecturer at the Department of Information Science at the University of Pretoria. She joined the department in 2011. She was formerly employed as an instructional designer in the private sector. She received her PhD in 2021. She is an enthusiastic lecturer and enjoys guiding students through learning material, encouraging critical thinking and developing content to teach them um, and, and working out exercises to strengthen their skills. She's also a keen researcher and is particularly interested in how technology can help people to cope with the vast amount of information available and how it can be used to create new opportunities when working with information. Her more specific research interests are information organization, information seeking and retrieval, digital humanities and scholarly communication. She has published several, several articles and presented at conferences. In addition to that, she won the best poster award at the Information Behavior Con Conference, um, other, otherwise known as ISIC, in 2020, which was held in Pretoria, South Africa. So without any further ado, I'm going to um, hand over to our first speaker, Dr. Salubi, and then when he's finished, um, Dr. Uh, Liesel Ball will 
will take over and we will then address comments after that. So over to you, Dr. Salubi. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Leanne, and good morning, um, colleagues and fellow um, professionals. Um, I've been introduced, so I don't think I need to go through that protocol um, again. So I'll just quickly share my screen. And um, I'd just like some feedback. Can you see my screen? Well, is my screen visible? Is my screen visible uh, to everyone? Yes, Thank thanks. And um, um, thanks so much to um, Leosa and the Retake um, Inform um, subgroup for um, inviting me. But before I just go on, just by a show of hand, because um, I really appreciate it so that I know my audience, um, if you're in the doctoral journey already, or you're thinking of beginning the doctoral journey, um, can you just um, share your hands? You can use the raise hand button. Thank you, Chandra. Um, you're already in the journey, or you're thinking of beginning the journey. Um, just a show of hand. Okay, you've gone through the journey and you've completed it. Um, a show of hand, you can use the raise hand button. Okay, thank you. So, um, is it safe if I assume that um, the, the other colleagues who are joining us now, um, which is um, also in the majority, um, we're actually here because we're considering going into this journey at some time. So that, that would be my assumption so that I also know um, how to speak as I go forward. Um, I only have 15 minutes, so and I just want to make the best of it. So sometimes the, the doctoral journey can actually um, feel very lonely or alone, but in reality, you're never lonely. That's, that's just the truth because you've got a whole lot of people around you. You've got your supervisor, you've got um, the fellow professionals, fellow doctoral students and all of that. I'm very sure that a whole lot of us were familiar with this book um, by Chinua Chibi, Things Fall Apart. Um, but we're not talking about things fall apart today. Um, things fall apart and the center cannot hold. That's much. But today we're actually looking at some. If your thesis to fall apart, um, when the center of that thesis is not the theoretical framework. So we're basically looking at theoretical framework because that is the central um, point that hold the thesis together. Now, things by their very nature, they fall apart. They know dynamic entropy. So by their very nature, things actually fall apart. And you can actually say that the rate by which things fall apart is paid by um, research scenes, if you want to put it that way. So by research scenes, um, the knowledge state of the life of the researcher, you know, some form of willful ignorance of the researcher and, and all of that. So you could call those research scenes in quotes. And of course, one of the reasons why we embark on research, including doctoral research or doctoral studies is, is actually to bring about, especially in the social sciences and humanities, we want to find our answers to, you know, that will make the world a better place, society a better place and a more organized place so that, of course, things doesn't fall apart. And why doing that? We also do not want our thesis to fall apart. Why do we need a theoretical framework? There are two main, there, there are others, but there are two main things that the theoretical framework actually um, to do. And the first one, it's, it serves um, in line with the objectives. It helps the variables that you're actually using. You should actually be able to see how the variables in your study, they actually align together. And the second thing that it does is um, the, in the methodology chapter or in the methodology section of your work, how the study design and methodology meets rigorous research standard. So in your literature review, which comes first before your theoretical framework, 
Um, sometimes the theoretical framework is attached as part of, of, the, of the literature review. The problem that needs fixing has actually been highlighted because of course you're doing a research, it means that there is a problem um, that needs to be so solved. That's why you have some such thing as, as the problem statement or the research problem. So the theoretical framework, you can take a look at it as the toolbox. So you go in, you're, you're a carpenter, you actually know the tools that you want to make use of and all of that. So that's what the theoretical framework actually does for you as a researcher. It's your toolbox. The details of the theories, um, the proposition, the hypothesis, um, if you're using hypothesis in your study, the concepts, all of that, you will use to address or make sense of the problem. That is what the theoretical framework actually helps you to do. So um, if the hypothesis is there, all of the concepts and the variables that are in your studies and, and, and all of that, the theoretical framework actually helps you to, to make sense of, of, of those variables and hypotheses. So your job in, in a theoretical framework chapter is actually to discuss in detail what the tools they look like. So uh, how does the, the, the construct within the theory looks like, the variables within your study, what do they look like, the hypothesis that you're putting forth in the study, what do they look like? So the, the, the theoretical framework actually helps you to put all of those in, in shape and how they behave, how they interact with each other, how they have been used before, how have the theory been used before, um, how do they relate to one another, the constructs within the theory, and how do they also relate to the variable within your study, and how, which is the very, very important part of the, the, the entire relevance to your insight and objectives, and God is on drawbacks, which as a research that uh, you actually need to point out from your theory, what are the drawbacks? Okay, I see Theresa is saying she's struggling with audio. I'm not sure if that's from my side. Is it the same thing for everyone? Am I audible to everyone or is just Theresa having the challenge? We can't hear you very clearly, doctor. Okay. Uh, yes, sorry, Dr. Salubi, it, it, yeah, it breaks up quite a bit. Um, so I don't know if it's the connection on your side. Um, I'm not sure what. But I might just try speak. Okay, is it better now? Yes. Okay. yes. Okay, thank you. So what you do is that all of the drawbacks are, if you take, for example, a very, very piece of research. So if you take a look at Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and it's like, you know, uh, when, when, when one um, um, wrong of the of the um, psychological needs, the basic needs are not met. You cannot actually move on to the next step and all of that. But there are people who would suffer psychological needs just for self-actualization, which is you know, the final stage. And why they want to be, be a medical doctor and then they sacrifice the food for such. So those are some you could have and, and you have to highlight those as well. And at the end of the day, by the time you get to your methods chapter, then you have to discuss how you will operationalize all of these tools. So you can see that there is the synergy as, as the journey actually goes in all of the different sections. Now, if you take an analyze generally library and information about the fields when it comes to the issue of um, theoretical framework, and this is perfectly fine. I mean, research in the field has actually become very, very interdisciplinary that 
you know, we could be talking about marketing at one time and communication at other time and psychology at other time. And all of these are just intertwined together. So um, LIS has actually profited from this. If you take a look at um, example, if maybe I want to do, um, I'm using a theory antecedent transaction outcome, for example. I could use that theory to actually evaluate an LIS curriculum, but that's not primarily out of LIS. That won't make use of the technology acceptance model, which is from information system. That's a very common theory, which we also make use of in LIS. And, or maybe the theory of reasoned action, which is coming in from psychology. So why do users actually choose one information source or why do they consult or why make use of one source from the other and all of that? So the theories, even though they are not coming in from LIS, they are also very, very profitable to us as, as information professionals. So a valid theoretical framework would actually justify the importance and the significance of the work. So it doesn't matter where it's coming from. Um, you can actually run with it. Um, whatever field is coming from, from marketing, from communication, from psychology, um, whatever field it's actually coming from, we could definitely be able to run with it as, as alliance researchers. So I want to speak to a personal experience here, and this is where most of, of the talk is actually um, going to be coming from. Now, here was a topic my doctoral research, it was on the internet to undergraduates and its impact on the utilization of library information resources. Now, I had four research objectives and I had eight research hypotheses. Now, all of these, they were what I needed to work with and I needed the theoretical frameworks which could actually fit that in. In my case, I had to make use of two theories. And the first theory was the uses and gratifications theory. And that's definitely not from LIS, it's from, it's from the communications um, field. And the second theory is the expectation confirmation theory, which is from marketing. That's also not from LIS. Now, why did I need two theories, basically? Now, for my research question three, I needed a different theory entirely to uh, be able to fit in the constructs within it. So, because I'm looking at, uh, sorry, research question two, not, not research question three, research question two, evaluate the extent of library and information resources used among undergraduate students. Because I was looking at the use pattern and the use rate. So both the library and information resources use pattern uh, as well as the internet use pattern, and then the use rate as well for both the library as well as the internet. So if there is a preference of one over the other, then there must be some form of expectation from the users. And if maybe those expectations are better met, making use of um, a different source other than what um, they have, for example, instead of me making use of the library, I'd rather just rely on the internet even though um, if I'm using the generic web, the sources are in that uh, very reliable. So there are some form of expectation um, which they had. And then with the the UGT theory, which I was basically looking at, okay, what were they what, what were the gratifications that they were looking out for? Because part of the study also looked at internet addiction and, and, and all of that. Were, were there some form of instant gratifications that we're looking at for which thinking that the library would to provide all of those personnel wouldn't actually be able to provide those. So all of the constructs within these two theories and just because of my research question too, I had to import um, the expectation confirmation theory, why the UGT actually for research question one, 
three, and four. Now, my eight are uh, within the study as well. But at the end of the day, I came up with what is called the grander theory, fusing both the elements from the uses and gratifications theory and the expectation confirmation theory to come up with the, the, the use of library and information science uh, resources, library and information resources among Gen X students. So that was a totally different theory, um, a model, not a theory at this time, a different model from the two theories which I employed for my work, which was also published. So at the end of the day, I used theories from two different fields and we came to something within LIS now, which from my previous slides, when I, when I talked about LIS developed theories, not actually there. So one thing that LIS researchers and especially at the doctoral level, we've, we've also been able to do is the, the, the development of new models, which at least after long um, uh, proving of those models and, and utilization of those models, then they become widely available within the field as well. I feel like it's very lonely determining what an appropriate uh, uh, theoretical framework is. Um, how do you actually do that? Basically, the constructs within uh, the variables within your search problem and all of those would help you determine what would be the appropriate uh, theoretical framework that you should actually start or that you should actually adopt for your study. There are no hard and fast rules about uh, which theory is appropriate and which theory is not appropriate. But the problem that is to be solved, which is the research problem, the objectives that you have or that you, you, you hope that your study is going to actually achieve at the end of the day, um, all of those factors are going to be what would inform, are going to be what would inform uh, your choice of, of a theoretical framework. Thank you very much. I think I was able to um, stay within the 15 minutes. Uh, thanks very much, Dr. Salubi. Um, I'm sure you've given us a lot uh, to think about. And thanks for sharing our, your expertise with us and your experiences. I'm now going to hand over to our second speaker, Dr. Liesl Ball. Uh, so over to you, Liesl. Thank you. Um, maybe Leanne, I can just check with you that you can hear me and share, uh, see my screen. Uh, yes, I can hear you and we can see your, your screen. Thank you. Thank you. So good day, everyone. And it is a privilege for me to speak to you today. And I just want to take this opportunity to thank the LIASA Research, Education and Training Interest Group for organizing this webinar. In this presentation, um, I would like to give a brief overview of my study and then discuss two research methods that I used. Um, and finally, I would just like to share some personal experience which uh, could maybe be of benefit to some uh, who are listening to this webinar. So the title of my PhD is Enhancing Digital Text Collections with Detailed Metadata to Improve Retrieval. Now, my PhD journey started with the recognition that there is indeed an increasing number of digital text collections in the world. And several of these have been created by digitization efforts, often from libraries or other institutions. And of course, there are also digitally born information, but all adding to large digital text collections. Some of these, um, uh, large collections that you might know would be um, Google Books, Hattie Trust, or the Internet Archive. 
Um, so this large amount of information that is available has certainly captured the interest and attention of many people. And um, many people are exploring now the possibilities um, that these collections bring. So um, in order to explore some, uh, some large digital text collections, there various tools have been developed. Uh, one such tool is the Google Books Ngram Viewer. Um, um, here, I quickly want to jump to the next slide just to show that you the Google Books Ngram Viewer. Um, this tool allows you to search for the usage of uh, specific words or phrases um, in um, the Google Books uh, collection. And then um, this is displayed, the frequency of these words um, as they appear are displayed in a graph. And here you can see the example of pandemic and plague um, uh, in, in, in this collection. Um, so now, one of the disadvantages of this tool and some of the other tools that I've investigated is that the retrieval can be quite coarse. Um, so you cannot necessarily exactly specify the, the exact section of data that you want to explore. Um, and if you think about it, texts have, um, uh, so on a volume or a book level, have um, interesting properties or sections. Um, so you can think of a book, maybe in the book there's a preface, then there's a chapter, then there's a paragraph, maybe there's direct speech, maybe there's a little poem, maybe there's um, some quoted text. Um, and if you think on a word level, words can have different um, you can have a word um, that have, can have different part of speech categories. You think of a word um, apple where it is a noun or, um, or a, that, sorry, <laughs> that wasn't the right example of book. Book where it's a noun, you read a book or book, you book a flight. Apple was my example where um, you have a word where it's a noun, but it can then mean um, different things or there it can be a certain name. Or if you have a mouse or bar, a bar you can refer to a chocolate bar or a bar of gold or a restaurant where they're serving drinks. And these then have different semantic meanings. So we have uh, information on a uh, part of speech level, so morphological level, we have on a semantic level, um, all these, like lots of different informations about the structure of um, books or property. Um, um, structure, structure of books um, and language. Um, sorry, um, Leanne, can you just indicate that you can still hear me? Um, uh, yes, we can still hear you. I'm sorry, my, my computer made a noise and I was just worried that there was a power interruption and I just wanted to confirm. All right, so back to um, saying that there could, there could be lots of different properties about a text and the word in the text and it, ideally we would want to be able to filter according to these properties. So my study was about the investigation to what extent detailed metadata could be used to enhance text in order to improve retrieval. And in this, um, the study, a metadata framework was developed that could be used to encode texts on a detailed level, and um, it was tested by means of a prototype. So my study was an interdisciplinary study, so linking very well with uh, the presentation by Dr. Salubi saying, indeed, we are uh, doing interdisciplinary research in the LIS field. And I drew from insights and research from diverse fields. Um, I found that there was no traditional or single uh, method that was suitable um, to my study and a combination of methodologies um, was used. In this presentation, I just want to touch on two um, uh, uh, methods, and the one being grounded theory and the other heuristic evaluation. I think it's quite interesting in the light of Dr. Salubi's presentation, because of course, um, uh, grounded theory says that is when you take the approach, when you do not start with a theoretical framework or a theory, um, you start with the data. The researcher starts with the data, um, analyzes data, and then from there, um, categorize, uh, do certain categories, and then uh, develop a theory. 
So in this approach, the collection and anal analysis of data happens simultaneously. Um, it is actually rooted in sociology and it typically considers um, the actions and interactions of humans. Very often as the researcher um, analyzes the data, categories are developed in order to classify the data. Um, and then from there, um, theory development can occur. It's important that the researcher remain open um, and not to let previous knowledge uh, for, uh, determine the collection um, and analysis. Um, it is just worth mentioning that uh, this is not seen by all as a method. Um, some see it as actually as a process of qualitative analysis. Um, so how did I use this method or approach? Um, so as I used a combination of methods, my study was not a pure grounded theory study. However, I was influenced by the grounded theory approach and I used principles from this uh, to guide me in my study. Um, so in the first place, the criteria for evaluating the tools emerged from both uh, studying the literature um, and then the tools themselves. So as I've mentioned, um, I looked at various tools that were uh, used to study collections or explore collections, um, and then I evaluated these tools. Um, so uh, the literature, which you could see is more part of a liter traditional literature review, informed my uh, cat um, criteria, but also working with the, um, uh, the tools themselves um, influenced the criteria, the development of the criteria and as well as the categories for metadata. So the categories of metadata were developed and refined as the literature, the tools, and the samples of texts were studied. So for example, as I studied the text, there we would come across um, features of the text or properties that could be um, encoded and could be valuable for retrieval. And then that influenced the development of um, uh, the categories. Uh, um, that I used in the metadata. And then at the end of my study, I could develop a decision support system, which formalized the process used in the study, which then was then the part of theory development. So I really felt um, appreciated um, and found it helpful to understand that the, de that the, 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 the process of um, ground or the approach of grounded theory that your data uh, analysis could influence um, your your study. Okay, the next methodology that I quickly want to touch on is heuristic evaluation. In heuristic evaluation, experts evaluate an interface or a product systematically according to certain principles, and these are also known as heuristics. In this way, certain problems in the system can be identified. Now, heuristics can be general, category-specific, or product-specific. So general heuristics could be then applied, so there may be some general design principles you could think of that could be applicable to many systems or products. Category-specific would be then only those um, heuristics that would be applicable to a uh, product in a certain ca um, category, um, or a product um, specific would then only be for one um, very specific product. Um, it is suggested that there's between five or 10 heuristics that are sufficient. Um, one of the disadvantages of this method is that it can point out false errors, but it also has been very successfully used. And sometimes it is also combined with usability testing. Um, uh, so the, in the heuristic evaluation side, the expert works through the system, but in the usability side, the user then actually um, works on the system and then um, often um, these two methods are combined. Um, just as a note, I did not wear black gloves when I did the evaluation, but I thought the image um, on this uh, slide seemed to capture the idea of um, evaluating a system according to a set of principles. So how did I use heuristic evaluation? So as I mentioned, I had to evaluate various tools and then according to a um, certain criteria. And then the criteria that I developed for the study was or, um, selected then was the interface design. So in terms of also how easy is it to use for various people? 
the metadata that's available um, according to which uh, user can filter, and then also the search and filtering options that the tool um, allows. Um, or, and, and through this then uh, advanced search can, and filtering can be enabled. The complexity of the tool. So there were some tools where there's certain advanced features available, but then um, a user had to learn quite a complex language, like a query type language. Um, uh, then I also looked at any help files that were available. And if it was relevant, I, uh, I looked at the corpus, des design of the corpus. So I, um, I evaluate a number of, evaluated a number of existing tools as well as then my own prototype. And this evaluation allowed me to discuss the strengths and weaknesses and also make some recommendations for future developments. So before concluding then, just something personal from my own journey, and that is the concept of taking small steps. Um, of course, that is not only applicable to a PhD, um, it's useful for any project or task. And a PhD is just an example of quite a big project. And I think it is sometimes hard to go to your desk um, and think you are now, I'm now going to work on my PhD. Um, sometimes it is easier to think of smaller steps to take or for some smaller tasks to do, to say, all right, um, I'm just going to find an article, or I'm just going to summarize an article, or you know what, I'm just going to install the software. Um, uh, and, and so little by little, you take the steps. Of course, there are some days when you all have to take the big steps and do that difficult work. Um, but often, I think it is the small steps, the combination of small steps that will lead to the end. Um, and I found the following cartoon quite useful, and I was also very glad each time that I had finished a paragraph. Paragraph. Thank you. I think so much, Liesl, for your very interesting informative presentation. Um, I, I'm sure that those in our audience that um, are busy with their PhDs or thinking of embarking on, on, on their PhD will definitely um, get a lot of useful tips from your, from your presentation. So I'd like to thank both of our speakers for, um, for the very interesting presentations and for taking time to uh, join us today and share their knowledge with us. Um, okay, now I'm going to, um, there's now time for any questions or comments. So if you've got any um, comments, please type them in the chat box or otherwise you can uh, raise your hand if you would like to, to speak and we will attend to your uh, to your question or comment. Um, I'm just seeing, looking in the chat. Uh, nothing at the moment. Um, if you would like to, uh, if anybody would like to speak or say something, please just raise your hand and then unmute yourself and we will um, give you the the opening to speak. Sorry, Lian. <clears throat> Lian? Yes, yes. Yes, Just I mean, the, 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 as you have said, there is nothing much on the chat box except for a request from Teresa for Dr. Salubi's um, contact details. So if Dr. Salubi still available if you can just post this um, email address or otherwise we can make that available to, to anyone who would like to engage in further. Thank you. Okay. Okay, yes. Um, I will post the email addresses for both speakers in the chat. Um, and uh, those of you who would like to engage with them further um, after the session, then you'll be able to contact them. So I'm just going to put that in the chat. And um, if there are any other comments, please, um, you're welcome to 
address either of the speakers now. Leanne? Uh, yes, Anna, you're welcome. Yes, to sorry to, to interrupt. I would like to put a question to each of the two speakers, and I want them to sort of do that in a single sentence or two. What was the single most difficult thing as a human being for you? to do your doctoral research? In other words, not the, the research topic, the findings, but that process of walking through it. If you can single out just one thing that was the most difficult. Um, Dr. Salubi, shall I start with you? Well, I was thinking it's ladies first. Shop, <laughs> shop. Uh, so, the one thing I would actually say, looking for the right theory was, was difficult. Um, but then I had, a, um, we, we were a group of three students um, at the time and we, we were more like a support group to each other. But I think I would actually put that at the feet of, of my, the collection of my data. Um, I, had, I had a whole lot of challenges collecting my data although I made use of two universities, undergraduate uh, students from two universities. And um, I would say it's the data collection part. Um, thankfully, it's not during COVID. Um, so yeah, that was, that was around 2016 um, when I collected the data. But yeah, I would say the challenge was more on, on my data collection, but um, it was quite a very, very, um, the, the experience of the journey was, was really a nice one. And probably because of that support system that um, we had as, as colleagues, um, that might have been a factor as well. So um, find yourself a support system, just in addition to what um, Lisa has, has mentioned um, about rewarding yourself and you know, clapping for yourself for those little tasks and, and, and all that. Uh, thank you for that, Lisa. Uh, thank you, Professor Ina. Um, I think I'm going to uh, point out two things. Um, the first was, I think it was, it's just a very big project. And I think it is, it was daunting. Um, I found it daunting at some times. So I think um, that is why I, I may, maybe uh, I just th uh, added that little last bit of personal experience. I think for, I try to trick myself sometimes in th saying, all right, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do the PhD today. I'm just going to write a paragraph. If I do a paragraph, then I've done well. Or I had some quite complex software to um, to work with, and so then I would say, "All right, well, let me just see if I can. I'm just going to open, and I'm 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 going to see what I can do." And so, like, and so you, if you can just keep that, um, and with so with that, the incredible support of my supervisor, he has signed in today. Uh, um, I see. So um, just uh, to keep uh, motivating and say uh, confirming or either saying, um, you know, just uh, so um, that has been that that absolutely was wonderful. Um, and then I think what was difficult is uh, not actually related to the studies, but I went through quite a difficult time in my personal life. And so then you maybe look at the world a little bit uh, darker than um, when you are going through a happy time. And so it's not necessarily to, to, to do with the studies, but to keep motivated and keep doing. So I suppose that that you I suppose you are not you are in one human being and you can't completely separate yourself from the rest of your life. Um, so I think I guess take small steps and and uh, the um, that uh, so take small steps and keep motivated if you can. <laughs> yes, maybe Thank I can you. finish with that. Thank you, Liesl. Thank 
Okay. Thank um, you. Thank you. Oh, okay. Sorry, sorry, Leanne. Okay. Yes. Thank. Uh, thank you to both of you for your um, your words. Now, um, I'm just looking in the chat. I see that Edmund um, is asking, "How easy is it to identify a gap in the literature um, in order to formulate a research topic?" Um, so I don't know if either of the speakers want to respond to that. Um, I don't know if it is very easy. I think it will probably depend on your own journey. Maybe you stumble across something and you see that, or maybe you, in a conversation you uh, stumble across something, or maybe it takes you lots of time reading lots of articles. Um, I'm going to go with um, it depends on your own journey. Um, yeah, okay, thank you. Okay, I'm not sure if I was supposed to also respond to that question. Uh, um, Dr. Bo's response is fine. Uh, yes, you're welcome to Dr. Salubi. Yeah, um, I agree so much with uh, what she, she just said. And uh, some of the times it could also be, uh, apart from literature, it could be just um, your personal um, interactions, maybe from your workplace, um, for example. You might have a new system in place and you don't know if it's something that could be scalable to actually kind of reduce or increase some some of uh, some form of work efficiency or something. So um, the gap could come from anywhere, from your personal experiences, from reading the literature and, and, and all that. But definitely by engaging in literature, because that's where you would actually be able to uh, bring about what the problem is because then you need to tell tell what the problem is and why the research should actually be done and all of that which at the end of the day where, wherever it's coming from you still need the literature uh, to actually finalize that so um i would say um like what dr ball said it's, it's more like the, the the personalized um experience in general Uh, thank you, Dr. Salubi. Um, uh, Madiki, do you want to come in here? You, you were going to, sorry, I interrupted you earlier. No, that, that's okay, Lian. I just wanted to touch on the, on the chats, but you have already touched on, on one already. However, there's one at the top by, by David Thomas. I'm um, who's asking how long did your PhD journey take? If um, the two speakers could please respond to that. Okay, um, maybe I'll go first. I started my journey in, in 2015, and I completed the I completed the study. In, December 2017 and I graduated May 2018. So um, we can just put that at three years. Yes, I'm also trying to think now. I think I registered in 2018, I think. Yeah, and I submitted then in uh, 2021. Um, okay, thanks to both speakers. Um, I just want to go, I'm looking at the chat now. Um, Teresa is asking, to what extent does the supervisor help you in selecting su a suitable theoretical framework? Um, okay, so can either of the speakers answer that? I think that will speak more to me because um, Dr. Boz did make use of a grander theory. So um, I made use of um, theoretical, um, theoretical frameworks right from the very start of, of, the, of the way. And one thing is that your supervisor, especially at the doctoral level, is only playing an advisory role. Um, you own the work. So, um, you actually, what you're doing is, it's more like convincing the body of, you know, 
professionals and if I want to put it or experienced uh, professionals in the field already that okay this is what I'm doing this is why I think that ABC can fit into X Z and Y whatever so uh, they dare to advise okay this would not really fit in and, and all of that especially if you have that close relationship with your supervisor which um, thankfully, I have with mine. I have two supervisors, um, one main and one co. Cool. And it was also good because at the time that I had the challenge with um, the main supervisor because he had to leave the university, the co supervisor was there to actually finish up the work. So I'll say the, the work is yours, um, which is why you have to really be motivated in what you're doing so that when those challenges comes and and all of that is yours you own it and you are to convince and to say your supervisor can only play an advisory role to say okay this is what I, th I i think and this is what i see you may not be able to actually but this might not fit in and all of that but at the end of the day it's your work yeah but i don't know if dr boss will still want to add No, I think I left that question for you, but I, um, I also want to emphasize that uh, I, um, that yes, it is your work. The supervisor plays an important role in supporting and so on, but uh, that the work is yours in the end. And I think that is important to remember. Thank you so much uh, to- uh, Okay. Sorry, sorry I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, thank you so much um, to both Hazel and, and um, Dr. Salubi. There's another question from Danny Malan, who's asking if any of you use the research data management plans in your, in your studies. Thank you. Um, not in my study, no. Uh, for mine as well, uh, we didn't, and at the time, um that was the time i even submitted i'm not sure i think my university was still developing the research um, Okay, um, we didn't really get the second part of your response, but I think the long and short is that you, you did not use the, the, the RDMP because at the time, I think you said the university was, was developing a policy in that respect. Okay, thank you so much to, to both of you. The end? That's correct. Okay. Uh, yes, I don't see any other questions. In the chat, if anyone wants to make any comment, you're welcome to unmute yourself or put your hand up. Um, but otherwise, I would just like to give a big thank you to our two speakers, Dr. Salubi and Dr. Ball, for your very interesting presentations. I'm sure that um, uh, all of us um, that are either doing our PhD studies or thinking of doing so in the future, we'll have learned quite a, a, you know, a lot from your experiences that you have shared with us. Um, are there any other final comments or questions? Otherwise, um, I'd just like to thank in addition to the two speakers, thank everyone uh, for attending this webinar and um, supporting us in this um, this event. And, um, and yes, you're welcome to engage with either of the speakers. I have put the email addresses in the chat and then the recording will also be available um, after the session or, you know, you will be notified as soon as it is available. So thank you everybody and uh, Thank you, Anna-Marie Hurson, for your support and helping us with this um, the administrative um, um, 
issues and um, thank you everyone and keep well and keep safe. And uh, we can close this webinar now. Thank you everyone, bye. Thank, thank you. you, goodbye. Thank you so much.